Hi. Um, I want to introduce you to our next speaker, um, Jesus Clement, and his co-worker Guido Torra is also here. They're going to talk about Debian and Google, and yeah. So, welcome. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, I, if you need to interrupt me, please do, but I would like you to keep the questions to, towards the end so that we're going to give like 10, 15 minutes and, and we can talk about, uh, like, I can answer all the questions as, as best I as I can. So, my name is uh, Jesus Clement. I'm here with uh, Guido Trotter. We're both uh, system engineers in, in Google. He's based in Dublin, I'm based in New York. And I'm here to, to talk about a bit, uh, a bit about how we use Debian in Google. Uh, first of all, a bit of background. Why do we use free software? First, because we can. We can modify, we can change things, we can contribute back, we can solve bugs anytime we can. And anytime we have a, a little bug, like for example, the other day, uh, we got a DHCP problem that was trying to figure out what uh, an IP address for the first, int, uh, first Ethernet. The first Ethernet was not initialized until well before the initialization of the kernel, which is like went to the code, fixed the bug, continue working. Why Linux? G uh, sorry, new Linux. Uh, it's fast, it's reliable, it's uh, like under heavy development. A lot of people are using it, a lot of companies are contributing to it, and uh, it's just the best option that you can have when you have a few thousand machines out there running all the time. And why Debian? This is the question that I'm going to try to answer through the, through the talk. Uh, we used to use uh, something else, uh, an ancient version of Debian called Red Hat. No more. We've moved along. And uh, basically, uh, most of the things that, that we need to answer is like, why in the terms of like development and stability, the availability of the resources that we have, like management of the whole fleet of computers that we have, and uh, then maintenance and repairs and, and how you do testing. Most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is based on one product that we ended up doing. Uh, actually, Guido is one of the main developers, and most of the questions about that product will be headed to him. But I'll talk first about development in terms of Debian. Debian has a huge, like, huge community of developers that are continuously contributing back. It's an open project, meaning that anybody with the will and, and with the like, technical knowledge can contribute back to the project by becoming a Debian developer, by sending patches back. It's, it might not be easy to join as a Debian developer, but you can also do maintenance of, of packages without being a Debian developer. So for a company like Google, it's very easy to engage in that development. It's very easy to uh, hire new developers and uh, in opposition to, to other companies, which like sending patches becomes a, like a difficulty. You need to like belong to a certain company or belong to a certain community. Debian it's not such type of, of enterprise. It's like, it's project based on, well, you probably know about this, but it's, it's a project based on like volunteer contributions and uh, it has a lot of companies engaged to it so that you can like, it's, it's fairly easy for Google to like engage people into contributing and take contributions from the project and then integrate it into, into our products. Uh, another thing is that it's a truly free, environment. We can get uh, packages knowing that we can modify them and then we can contribute them back at the same time that uh, we can, like, this is like the, the, the eternal topic on like the, the price. It's like it's free as in like beer too. We don't have to pay money for it even though you can buy services from other companies. But it's also free, again, when you run like, your services in, in like, several thousand machines, paying licenses becomes a big burden on, on top of your services. Uh, there's nothing to say about the, 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 the capabilities of, of, the, of the people that work in Debian. They're like, some of the best programmers in the world are, are working there. 
the, the, the Debian policy is one of the best uh, descriptions of how a package has to be maintained and has to be set up so that it conforms to the Debian policy and it becomes a, like a package that you can install easily and quickly without uh, human intervention in most of the cases. On top of that, it has a very well-defined communication channel. Like we have the BTS, we have mailing lists. It's very easy to, to contact the maintainer by just opening the description of the package and reading who did the package. Contact the person. If you have a security bug, you can actually uh, send it to the security team without uh, exposing immediately a security problem that, that the package might have. So all those things make Debian as a very well-suited uh, product to be used internally because of like, the flexibility that it gives to all the things that, that we do in the company. The second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about mostly the use that we do of uh, Ganetti. Uh, Ganetti is, is a product we introduced a few years ago when we realized that uh, maintaining clusters of virtualized machines was becoming more and more difficult due to the amount of, of computing power that we were using. Ganetti, it's a product that uh, removes the burden of maintaining a cluster to, uh, to a level that is like much higher so that you can tell Ganetti to switch off all your instances, bring them back, move them to another machine. The system works in a way that a virtualized machine is just, uh, instead of having a cluster of, of machines that are working in parallel, that are physical machines, what we use is uh, Shen or KVM to virtualize all our systems in a way that uh, switching on and off a machine, it becomes uh, an easy task by just telling uh, the cluster master to switch off certain uh, instance of, of one of the services that you're running. It's an open source product that anybody can collaborate with, and uh, in fact, probably he can tell you more about how you can collaborate and you can contact him if you want to have, uh, you want to be part of the project. It's hosted in uh, code.google.com at the moment, so it's very easy to download the, the source code, find bugs, codes, like, of course, patches are very welcome. And uh, it's, it was conceived, deployed, and uh, developed in Debian. So it's very easy for us to just like, create those packages and, uh, and start using them immediately after we, we get a new package, we get a new version of the, of the software. So this brings me to availability of, of the, the resources that we use in, in, in Google. Uh, in, in most of the cases, we are like having a huge amount of computing power that is basically uh, physical machines. So the use of Kinetic allows us to immediately and quickly bring up instances. So whenever you, you want to have a new DHCP server, you just uh, go to an interface that we, ha we have created internally. There is another group working on, uh, on an external version of, uh, of the system that we use. What do you remember the name? The, the, the external version of Virgil. External version of what? Virgil. Oh, um, there is the Ganetti web interface, which is basically an interface to manage Ganetti clusters. It's developed by the Oregon State Open Source Lab. And uh, basically, it substitutes some of our internal tools based on Ganetti. Um, regarding Ganetti, a few points that I wanted to make is that basically we're, we strive to be one of the best behaved open source projects at Google. So we have uh, both the corporate policies, for example, we do code reviews for all the code, we have an extensive test suite and QA for all the products, but at the same time, what we do, we do all in the open. So any patch, any design contribution is discussed on an open mailing list that anybody can join. So it's very easy for new people to contribute to our community, like, for example, in Debian, which is 
not always true for open source product in businesses in general. Thank you very much. So, can you hear me now? So he's asking, uh, sorry, repeat the question again. The project exists and is called Ganati since a few years. We suspect that it will keep its own name, which is Ganati. But why would we change the name? Um, one, okay, one thing that maybe is uh, lost or something is that we don't sell or plan to give virtual machines out on this. This is a product that we use to run our corporate infrastructure and you can download it and use it to run your own infrastructure. But it's not something we sell you or we offer you services on. So that's, that's a big distinction. So in that sense, no, it, it won't change name, but it's not a Google mainstream product that you actually like, buy from Google or use in the sense of Google Apps or Google Docs, right? To become the part of the basic. Oh yeah. That, so the the question is like if the Ganetti web interface will become part of the of the Ganetti package. Uh, so far, we don't have any plans for doing that. Uh, Ganetti web interface. It's a uh, it's a different project that is developed in uh, in sync with Ganetti. But we haven't yet uh, had a discussion on, on if we are going to integrate it or not. Uh, so basically, uh, using Ganetti web interface. Uh, we have an internal version that it, it ties to, to our uh, infrastructure because we have a different systems that have to be tied together. So we have created uh, an interface that you can basically uh, request at any time a new instance of your service and then a few minutes later, it takes a bit longer because we, we usually wipe the disks before we, we activate a, uh, an instance. A few minutes later, you have uh, a working environment that you can start using uh, like immediately. Uh, we combined several open source projects like uh, Puppet, we combined uh, Ganetti, and we combine uh, the capabilities that the Debian installer has with preceding to do everything very easy, very quick, and it's totally unattended. It's like if there is a problem during the, during the installation, you will get a pop-up in, in, uh, in a ticket that says that your system couldn't be installed correctly, but mostly it's, uh, it's completely unattended. So requesting services is very easy and very quick once you have a, a need for, for new resources, which is really, really, really important when you have, again, several thousand machines running in the background, and then you need a thousand machines more to, to install the new fastest uh, caching system that, that you want to develop and deploy in, in all the offices that you have around. So it, having such an interface, have such a flexibility to request those services or to destroy those services once you have finished with your work, it's, it's a very important thing to have. Uh, again, there is a, a Greek team that is also developing a, a different interface to, inter, uh, to interact with, uh, with Ganetti and to request uh, services. That's uh, another open source project. But it's, uh, actually, he can talk more about it. Raise your hand. There you go. So uh, another thing that is very important uh, and, and the Debian offers us, it's the capabilities of managing the fleet. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's inherent uh, uh, feature of Debian to have, uh, like again, in, uh, brought by the policy, it's very easy and very convenient uh, to have packages installed. So internally, we actually use the same uh, unstable uh, testing and stable tracks for all the packages that we manage internally. So uh, once a, uh, a team has finished uh, a release of, of a new package, they have a building system that automatically brings the source code into, into a package and then it gets distributed to all our repositories in, in unstable uh, along the company. From there, uh, upgrades are automatic in all the systems that track unstable. And uh, one of the good things about using Ganetti is that we can give administrator access 
to the users. So basically, you bring an instance up, and then you can, like, a new team is, is creating this new product, and then they have full access of the whole machine. They can, like, change whatever they want, and if they break it in non-repairable ways, they can just bring the instance down, bring the instance back, and start from scratch. We use this even for, for remote desktops. So all, the, all your home directory is basically on an NFS that is very close to the, to the cluster where you're running your, your instance. So if you break your own machine, you don't have to call TechStop or you don't have to call uh, anyone to come and reinstall everything for you. You just like go to a web interface, say destroy, recreate, and immediately after you get a fresh installation that you can start breaking again. Uh, one of the, also, one of the very, very good things that we have, again, is, as I mentioned before, Puppet. So to create a common infrastructure across the whole fleet, we use uh, Puppet for distributing configuration files so that it sets up the machine like once after preceding has finished and you have the operating system. There's a cron job that immediately on the first boot runs Puppet preparing the machine for proper use, like installing tools that are used internally for uh, collaborative uh, development, installing uh, uh, source control uh, clients like Git, like uh, Perforce that you, we use internally, uh, like all the basic Kerberos configuration, hooking up to your home directory. And uh, we use uh, a modified version of LDAP to distribute groups so that you can actually like, get full control of, of who access your machine so you can create groups of users that, that can help you to, to work on, on your pet project. Maintenance and repairs are also based on Ganetti. Uh, it's, it's a very, very well uh, tested feature right now to, to do live migration. So whenever you have one machine that it's like, uh, the machines are, are replicating uh, the hard disk drive using DRBD. So basically, when you have a system running, you're actually saving your data in two different nodes of the same cluster. So if you want to repair one node, you can do a live migration of one of the systems to a different system, and then it continues working, reading the data from the new system. So you bring down the one system that you want to repair or to bring to, uh, like change a, a memory module, you run your service at the same time when their machine is being repaired, and when that machine comes back, you can resync the hard disk drive to the old machine and then start like reinitialize the connection from your instance to the old machine, and then if you want, bring the machine back to the, bring the instance back to the old node where it was working. So it makes repairs and maintenance and like upgrades. Very, very easy operation. Again, this whole, this, like, uh, this is one thing that, that you could probably do with many other systems and many other distributions, but Debian provides the flexibility of the whole package being just fit to do whatever we want to do in the right way. So there's a question there. Yeah, so... While using the RDB, what happens if a virtual machine fails because I don't know of a hardware problem while running? Sorry, uh, if I, you said you are using the RDB, so yes. what happens if a virtual machine is failing because of a hardware issue, for example, while it's running? Mm -hmm. And um, would you consider switching to a project like Remus that would wouldn't mind with such issues? Uh, right now, it's, that question is something that uh, we don't, uh, can probably answer that uh, later at the end of the, like, or you can answer now. So, mostly the um, switching to another project wouldn't solve the fact that the virtual machine, as far as virtual CPU and virtual memory, anyway, runs on one physical node. So if that node goes down we can reboot at any time the virtual machine on the second node, but it's basically a virtual machine crash. What we do to alleviate that is we monitor the physical machines very closely, and when we see that a physical machine, for example, has memory errors or has disks that are going to go bad because it has some, have some back, bad blocks, we evacuate it preventively to avoid the downtime. 
But if a machine actually crashes, any kind of distributed block device will not help us basically recovering um, the status that was in memory. And there are uh, projects like Chimera or others that allow you to run the virtual machine on top of two physical nodes, but we think that they are basically too expensive for them to be useful in production, and we'd rather have uh, machines that are expendable and have on the services a further layer of uh, uh, availability. So any service, for example, is load balanced and multiply available that way. Actually, we've been requested to remove the RBD for even increased performance because some of the services don't care at all that the machines go down and can easily fall back to other machines or to other data centers, but prefer the more performance that they can have. Yeah, that, that's one of, the, one of the things that we try to do in our internal services. It's to, like, all the services that can be spent then we spend them in the sense that, uh, for example, uh, most of our DNS data is stored in a database. So most of our DNS instance instances are uh, unique on, on the hard disk drive. So whenever you have to remove that because like, of, of a hardware failure, then immediately you can bring another DNS instance and then dump all the data and then start it again. So that, that's a problem that, that we try to solve on the, on the software layer by making our tools more resilient instead of like trying to, to make the hardware better. In fact, with like the, 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 the huge amount of machines that we have, like we have repairs happening every single minute. Like in, in, a, in a group of 10,000 machines, one sixth of the, uh, sorry, 6% uh, of those machines are having usually some kind of issue. And then we have like a lot of people working on, on, on trying to repair those, but it's not as, uh, like having uh, the possibility of bringing instances on machines that are healthy, it, it becomes a really, really uh, quick task that, that don't require like people running around with segways as, as we used to have before. And again, like another thing that, that allows, uh, allows us to do is uh, the, the easy way of like bringing up for testing like a thousand machines that you need for, for some kind of uh, product testing test everything you want there, like put stress tests, put uh, capacity tests, put OS constraints, because in the moment that you build your instance, you can say how much memory you're going to have, how much hard disk drive you're going to have. So you can see, like, for example, uh, LDAP used to be an uh, increasingly growing tree that we had uh, on our systems, and we wanted to know exactly what was the limit on the memory that, that uh, an LDAP system could, could work freely without having any constraints. So it's really easy just to bring a machine with, like, say, two gigabytes of RAM, put all the LDAP tree there, stress test it, and the moment that it crashes, then try with four, try it with eight. And, and you have like, a really easy way to select the, the memory. You can also go back to old operative systems to see if those uh, operative systems still work in, in a new platform. So the moment that you get like the new set of, of brand new computers, you can you have a service that only runs in a specific OS, and then you can just like bring a couple of instances on that OS, run your your project on, on that uh, hardware, and see if, if it behaves correctly or it has some bugs introduced by new chipsets or by new features on the on the processor. And again, like removing all that is like an, an easy task of like just going to a web panel and then select all your machines remove and then disappear, uh, providing uh, that, that, that capacity back into the pool for everybody else to use. And uh, like last thing, but not least, uh, most of our Debian-based, uh, I mean, we have, fortunately, we have some products running in, in Windows and, and other things that I won't mention. But most of our engineering workstations at, and laptops for internal use, they work on, on Debian, like uh, Intel base. We also have Mac OS, but that's a little shame that I have. Uh, most of our corporate services, LDAP, DNS, uh, cachings, uh, web servers working internally, they all work using Debian. And uh, most of them work in Ganeti. We have, again, like dedicated uh, machines without any, any instance and uh, without any uh, clustering layers. 
due to the, the requirements. Like uh, we need like really fast caching systems in, in our engineering offices. So we put bare metal, but it still is running Debian. And uh, again, like corporate infrastructure, we have a pile of data centers running uh, Ganetti on Debian so that we can like provide services for new projects, services for, for engineering, uh, remote desktops, and uh, for like test of new products. And I believe this is question time. So, could you clarify um, the, um, the um, hi? Uh, could you clarify what Debian-based and which percentage do you have of Debian-based systems and Debian systems? I, I, I've read in the press about Ubuntu and Ubuntu, but I'm not sure in what, how much Debian you use. Thanks. I wanted to ask the same question, but oh, basically sorry, with, yes. so with what you. version of Debian do you use, Sid? Um, so, okay. We have various systems using different things. Most of engineering laptops and workstations actually use an internal flavor of Ubuntu, um, which is, as you know, a Debian fork, but is not exactly Debian. Now, for example, for development of Ganetti, Developers mostly prefer Debian itself. Uh, I personally use Wheezy. We're thinking of migrating, but, and we're in the process of migrating the physical fleet to Debian, and I think for now we're staying on Lenny, but we want to move to Squeeze later on for various internal reasons related to the hardware we have to run it on. So it's, it's really different ones. Um, we have an OS team that manages the OS images internally. So most of what they do is based on Ubuntu, and they have a close relationship with Ubuntu people. But what we do in the Ganetti virtualization platform layer and on the nodes itself is, at least at the development side and in the future, probably also in the production side, based on Debian itself. And the version, of course, is in flux. Most of what I can tell you is that even if it is going to be uh, Lenny or Squeeze, it's going to be heavily modified with at least backports and some other internal things. Like the version of Ganet is not going to be the one that is included in Lenny. The same is for the RBD and the packages we care about. We'll tailor it to the ones we tested and think will work better together. Any more questions? Yep. I want. Hello? That's. That microphone is for ambient noise. <laughs> you were just on the internet. Hello, Marga, by the way. Hi. Um, I just, I think it would be useful to. Can you, can you stand up so I can? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think it would be useful to elaborate a bit on what made Debian more attractive than uh, Red Hat Enterprise. So, the factors that made you choose to migrate. Like, as I said, one of the, the most, most, most inter in important things and most interesting things was the fact that uh, the community was open to, to collaborate, like, from us and, and, like, the pool of Debian developers is much bigger than, than Red Hat developers. The people working for, for Debian were eager to either, like, uh, join Google and get hired by us, and continue working in their projects. Uh, one thing that, that we all do in, in our team is uh, we contribute back to Ganetti in one way or another. So every time that you see a release produced by Widow or by another of our colleagues called Usting, it's mostly the work of, of all the people that work internally, one way or another, like reporting bugs, uh, contributing code. Uh, another thing is the fact that uh, internal people that were already working for Google, they could contribute back in several ways, like through new maintainer process, like being Debian maintainers, or becoming Debian developers. 
we have actually a list of, uh, I think, five or six people that started working for Google before they became Debian developers. And we have a list of uh, 25 plus Debian developers working. So it's, it's something that, like, if you want to collaborate with a project that you're actively using, Debian was providing something that, uh, like, Red Hat when I joined wasn't. Another thing is uh, the Debian package, um, uh, the Debian DPKG, so the, the Debian package system. It's much more reliable than anything that we had before. So it, it allowed us to do an unmaintained, unsupervised upgrades. Like most of the Mondays when I come to work, my Debian uh, workstation says that, oh, by the way, we have installed this and this and this new package, and you just have to reboot. And then I get a little sign in my message of the day saying that I have to reboot the machine because like new kernel packages had, had been uploaded. In, in other systems that, including Solaris and, and uh, like Red Hat and whatnot, that was a bigger problem. It was a bigger burden created on, on, on the maintenance of, of the fleet so that you want to, to maintain uh, uh, like all the computers more or less the same. That answers your question. Okay. Short. He doesn't have a mic. Um, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, has Google um, used someday um, CF Engine? Because I heard that you also used CF Engine. Yes, we used to use uh, CF Engine before, but we have moved to Puppet. Why? Uh, CF Engine wasn't providing uh, the capability of centralizing the configuration across the whole fleet. It was much more difficult to run on uh, Windows and run on Solaris and run on Mac OS. With, with Puppet, we can, for example, change uh, a DNS server for a whole region in all the different flavors of operative systems, just updating a Puppet manifesto or a Puppet... Uh, okay. Rule. And... Second question, um, is it right that Google developers normally develop on a virtual machine instead of their laptop? Sorry, come again? Um, Google developers, do they uh, develop on a virtual machine hosted on the cluster or do they uh, work on their laptop uh, regularly? The, the situation right now is very varied. Like we have a lot of people working with their own workstation. But uh, that usually happens when, when you are on a non-engineering office. It's much easier for you to like, develop locally than develop remotely. That is changing all the time. Like some people move to a, to a remote uh, instance so that they can develop over there. And whatever they use, it's either a laptop or a, or a dumb terminal. So they connect to the, to the instance, and then they have the whole uh, like a big bunch of, of clustering machines that they can send their jobs to be uh, compiled in a distributed fashion and then they collect all that in, in, their, in their instance. If you do that, if you do that in, in places like Finland where we have a one or two engineers, whenever they compile locally, they have to send either like compile everything locally or send everything over the wire to, a, to a, an engineering hub where it gets compiled and then it brings it back. So it, like all that transaction, it, it becomes much slower. So usually it's, it's those people are using uh, instances in a data center. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Oh, uh, well, uh, so in the pa in recently Google has gone public with the fact that uh, you have been attacked apparently by hackers from China and uh, understandably you have probably done some things to react to that. So my question is what are you using for best practices around security and specifically are you using SE Linux? If we're using what? A a security enhanced Linux. Uh, well one thing that we've definitely been using about security, which is public, is uh, the um, enhanced authentication. So this we've been also trying to push to our Gmail users or to corporate users that have Google Apps and basically consists in the fact that 
you can have an OTP generator always with you to, to authenticate to your Gmail. Uh, we have that. We have uh, some corporate policies, policies regarding like systems you can use to access Google content or what kind of content you can access from where and things like that. I'm not, of course, going to discuss this in detail. Uh, and I don't know if I can answer any C Linux related questions. Uh, Sorry. One, one answer that I can give you is that uh, we use, uh, again, as, as I was saying before, we have uh, an OS development team. And in, in very close fashion with that OS development team, we have a, a group of security operators. And they introduce uh, policies for our laptops. So when you use a laptop and you want to connect to the Google infrastructure, you have to uh, use uh, an approved laptop. Uh, I don't believe it uses the Linux, but I, I cannot answer further that question because I'm, I'm not uh, in close relationship with those people. I'd like to repeat, uh, I'd like to repeat the question, the first question actually, about the extent of, that you use uh, Debian within uh, Google, because I feel it wasn't uh, fully answered. Uh, like about a rough estimate of the percentage of, of the use of Google in the infrastructure, there was uh, Partly, it was partly answered about uh, personal machines. Again, like I, I cannot give you like detailed numbers because first I don't have them, and and probably if I had them, I would be breaking so many policies that, that they would fire me. But uh, what I can tell you is that it's a it's a continuous flux. Like we started again, like. Three, three and a half years ago when I started, we were like using actively Red Hat and it went through a, a flux of changes in the desktops. We added Ubuntu, which is again like a Google specific version of Ubuntu. Right now we have uh, a big bunch of our fleet is based on, uh, on modified versions of, of that Ubuntu for servers. But there are services that are coming up that uh, require a specific version of Debian because they, they want to have specific uh, set of tools that are only provided on certain uh, versions. We have a development working, like for example, Ganetti that is working in, in purely Debian and it's more and more moving to, to work in, in Debian. In fact, uh, there is one project that I finished uh, a month ago and shamelessly I haven't published yet, which is a, a, like a USB stick that you can install, like an image for a USB stick that you can install on a computer and every other computer that is connected in, in an internal network, you can make it uh, a Ganetti node immediately in like five minutes. It's all based on Debian. And uh, it, like the Debian USB stick is Debian installer for like modified to, to provide all your services that you need. So it, it depends on, on the project mostly and, and we basically don't have control. We just provide through the Ganetti interface all the operative systems that people can use. Any more questions? Okay, one, two, and gone. Thank you very much.